many games let us determine classes, skills and builds and other ask us more bigger, more personality driven questions. Sure, in real life it's not so simple, but in video games sometimes the question is, are you good or are you evil? Being good certainly has its benefits, but in many cases choosing the path of evil is so much more rewarding. I'm CypherWhatCulture.com and these are 10 powerful video game abilities only evil players unlocked. Number 10. Dishonored. At its core, Dishonored is about player choice. The game's main draw is deciding whether protagonist Corvo achieves his goals through murderous means or simply sneaks his way to success. In case you've never played it, the game takes place in the city of Dunwell, which is currently suffering one hell of a plague. Infected rats feast on the dead and are turning people into violent monsters called weepers. The good ending of the game is the one that sees you putting an end to the plague and by extension this means not giving more food to the rats by killing, you know that already egregious sin, and instead using non-lethal methods. As you play through Dishonored you're free to customise your Corvo however you like but there is at least one ability that you're really only going to get if you've decided to throw deuces to Dunwell and want to watch it burn. Devouring Swarm is an appropriately icky name as the ability summons a legion of plague infected rats to distract, gnaw on and kill your opponents. There's no subtlety nor any real sneakiness in this one, becoming the Pied Piper of the Plague is straight up vicious and will contribute to you eventually getting the bad ending. But on the other hand, it's really cool in that disgusting sort of way. Number 9. Abe's Odyssey. You wouldn't expect one time PlayStation mascot hopeful Abe to have a dark side, would you? One of the most important goals of Abe's Odyssey is not simply one's own escape from Rupture Farms, but saving Abe's fellow Mudokans along the way. The game even shows you signs on how many employees there are and their eventual fate. Odyssey has two different endings. The good ending triggers when the player rescues 50 of Abe's buddies, and otherwise, players get the bad ending. However, there's actually an extra added secret. Simply being ambivalent towards your enslaved species isn't enough, you have to be actively twisted to achieve this by killing the Mudokans yourself. There are 300 Mudokans in the game and not all of them are near deadly machinery, pits or enemies and thus you have to deliberately lead many of them to their doom. With 250 murders on your three fingered hands you'll suddenly return to the start of the game with invulnerability. Considering that Abe's Odyssey can be quite the challenging little puzzler, it makes a hell of a difference. All you have to do is commit genocide against your own species and it doesn't get much more evil than that. Where this power comes from we'll never know but it has dark implications about Abe sacrificing his own kind for supernatural purposes. Number 8. Black and White Peter Molyneux's black and white games are celebrated as really unique PC titles with a great concept and at the time industry setting AI. In them you play as a god pulled from the void by an early society looking for meaning and purpose. You alongside your choice of animal stand-in are then worshipped by these people and it's your task to shepherd them how you see fit. Naturally, being a god, you get the last say on how everything goes, and you can rule your land as a benevolent deity or an evil one with a much more metal-looking temple and an ominously satanic hand. Your creature will also morph and change appearance to match this. Pets do take after their owner, after all. Throughout the game, players can perform miracles with enough prayer or sacrifices from their followers. Good players get all the hippy-dippy stuff you'd expect. Evil players get the ability to summon fireballs, storms, and and wild packs of animals to attack any unfortunate souls you so choose. Just like the thousands of gamers who have found cruel and inventive ways to kill off their poor sims, Black and White really lets players revel in their dark side. Number 7. Infamous Sucker Punch's infamous games really stuck out for going the entire hog with their morality system. Not only does it affect the story, but the gameplay system is completely different depending on how you play. Your actions as Karl McGrath gain you karma and that karma gates out certain abilities on the wider skill tree. If you decide to play the part of an altruistic Marvel style superhero then you'll get access to skills that have you non-lethally stunning enemies and healing others. And that's fine, but if you do this then you won't be able to get the best powers in the game. From Infamous's first release until today most players will agree that playing as a walking weapon of mass destruction is just more fun. Not only do you not have to worry about protecting civilians, taking them out actively helps your progression. The selfish Colm McGrath gets access to arc lightning and an energy sapping bio leech power that just makes combat more enjoyable. Open world games invite us to cause chaos and you can have a better time with that if you're flying around throwing lightning blasts at people and practicing your best evil laugh. <laughs> Sorry. Number 6. 
Chrono Cross. One of the fan favourite characters of the always underrated Square RPG Chrono Trigger was the Honourable Amphibian Knight Frog. Ergo, Chrono Cross, the game's pseudo sequel, features a character which is essentially a big old nod to him. Glenn looks like the human form of Frog and even shares his human name. He's also, perhaps most importantly, one of the better party members of the game's stacked roster of 45 characters. More importantly, he has a dual tech with the game's main protagonist, Surge. These tech skills are easily missable if you don't recruit both of the necessary necessary fighters, but having yours alongside Surge guarantees it'll be put to good use, which is great since it rocks. You can't get Cross Strike without Glenn, and you can't get Glenn unless you refuse to help to find a cure for the ailing character of Kid. Instead of picking the heroic and righteous option, you need to simply shrug your shoulders and give up on it. It's not outright evil, but it is downright cold-hearted. Thankfully it all works either way because she survives even if you don't help her, but Kid probably won't forget your apathy in the face of her death, you horrible git. Number 5. Sky Skyrim. Skyrim doesn't have a morality system, but it does have a host of things that players can optionally do that are objectionably evil. Actually, it's a game where a lot of its best content, abilities, and character builds are locked behind being at least a little cruel. It's good to be bad in Skyrim. The various Daedric princes of the land, the old gods of the realm, each have their own quest, and several of these are of questionable morality. One of these is called the Taste of Death, which already should alert you that this is not necessarily the most bright and happy of objectives. Ozzy Osbourne might also call himself the Prince of Darkness, but Namiya probably lays better claim to this shared title, considering they have a cannibalistic cult dedicated to them. To appease this cult, the player leads an unsuspecting priest to their domain where they have prepared a feast. Here, the player can kill and eat the poor man's flesh to gain the cult's trust. This grants them the Ring of Namira, which promotes stamina and health and comes with the added ability of not unremarkable HP regeneration when the player chooses to feed on corpses. If you're playing a certain way, and chances are you are if you have the Ring of Namira, that's an endless supply of potential health regen. <laughs> Number 4. Goat Simulator There's all kinds of havoc to be had in Goat Simulator, such as destroying garden parties, taking part in goat fighting rings, and generally ruining things for the placid town of Goat Isle. The goat isn't necessarily framed as a good guy, but more a neutral party, an agent of chaos through which the player can just turn their brain off and go nuts. However, the goat can gain some pretty devastating abilities that cross the line of true neutral into pure chaotic evil. And naturally, the way to gain these powers is through demonic sacrifice in the foothills of the mountains of Goat Isle, there is a glowing pentagram. Dragging humans or dropping goats onto this enough will eventually appease whatever dark mammalian exists on the other side and grants the power of the Devil Goat. This demonic little guy is not only faster than the standard goat, but has the ability to draw nearby items together into what is essentially a black hole. Careful though, as ragdolling as the Devil Goat sends you flying sky high. Moreover, the Devil Goat's powers are so great they're practically unstable. When they're combined with other mutations for the goat, it can even go so far as to crash the game. Now that's power. Number 3. Spider-Man Web of Shadows Spider-Man for the PS2 and Insomniac's 2018 outing are quite rightfully lauded as some of the best Spidey games of all time, but that isn't to say that the webbed one hasn't had more quality outings that tend to go overlooked. Web of Shadows, developed by Sharba Games and Treyarch, offers players two totally different Spider-Men to play as. There's classic red and blue Spidey, who is fast, agile, and as heroic as we all remember, and then there's Symbiote Spider-Man. Whilst he doesn't have the dancing capability, of Tobey Maguire in the previous year's film, he is all about destruction. Both Spidey suits have their own upgrade path and set of abilities, but it's the black suit that stands out because some of the ideas are really unique, namely the ability to ride your enemy like a surfboard. Yep, honourable red and blue Spider-Man would never do it, but black suit Spidey can jump atop his opponent and ride them around as the ultimate act of humiliation. The player has full control of this and can use the streets of New York like a twisted bowling alley, throwing themselves headfirst into more enemies for even more hilarious carnage. If the black suit is returning an Insomniac Spider-Man sequel, then we really need to see this city surfing skill in full HD. Number 2. Might and Magic 7 The long-running Might and Magic series was in many ways ahead of its time, and even though some of the games at first glance have aged like curdled milk, they did really cut some paths for the Western RPG to follow. In the seventh game, players are presented with the quintessential choice of light and dark. This determines a few things, such as gating off certain side quests, and also determines which towns in the world of Enroth hates you depending depending on your alignment. Yeah, you stinky good folk, get out of our pixelated town. Classes in the game can ascend to new ranks depending on your choice, with the best example being the sorcerer becoming the lich if you choose the side of evil. This guy is incredibly resilient to certain types of magic, and most importantly, the dark spells you can wield are just intensely more interesting and more powerful than the light magic. Their ultimate skill is called Soul Drinker, which drains all targets of life and transfers it to the party in the form of HP, which is pretty damn helpful. Also, it'll set you up to withstand 
wielding the spell called Armageddon, which is about as powerful as it sounds. And number one, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Amongst the many Star Wars video games, Knights of the Old Republic remains beloved among fans as a window into the galaxy far, far away. As a Bioware RPG, there are a lot of things to do and a lot of choices to be made. One of these being the age-old question of Star Wars lore and the one that haunted Anakin Skywalker almost as much as his hatred for sand. Be you Jedi or be you Sith. Either way, you can swing around a lightsaber to your heart's content and use the most basic of Force powers. However, appropriately, both Jedi and Sith have their own set of unlockable abilities. By the intermediate level, Jedi are learning how to cure and shield, whereas the Sith were having way more fun with Force lightning and Force choke. One of the Sith's most entertaining abilities was simply titled Kill, the act of walking into a room and Force noping everyone in sight. By the end of the game, evil players can just kill everyone in the room with a flick of their wrist. And what of their goody two-shoes contemporaries? Well, their best offensive skill is killing a single droid unit at a time. It's like Anakin once said, from my point of view, the Jedi are lame. And that's the list. Let us know what you thought of this video down in the comments below. Which of these powerful evil abilities did you enjoy wielding the most? And of course, let us know of any others that we didn't include. Make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe and hit that notification bell. Head over to whatculture.com for more content on the daily. I've been Cypher Whatculture and have a good week.